But I want to preach to you about this morning uh, guilt. I want you to turn two passages. The first one is Matthew chapter 5. That will be the text for, that we'll be using this morning. We'll stand in a few moments and read it. I want you to turn then, after you've got your finger in Acts chapter 5, to the book, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 5, I want you to turn to, Ma- to Acts 24. I'm shaking hands on Sunday morning. A fellow shakes my hand. He said, my wife and I need to see you. What are you doing tomorrow? I said, come to the office, be here at 9 o'clock. He and his wife walk in. He takes the chair right here at the corner of my desk, and he's turned facing the wall over here. His wife goes to the chair that is over on that side in the corner. And we have prayer. And he looks at me, and angrily he says, there are times I feel like just punching my kids. His kids, the oldest one is probably about seven. And he has three. What's wrong with that fella? What's wrong with that fella? As he makes that statement, his wife puts her, bears her hands, her face in her hands, she begins to cry uncontrollably. I look at him. And I ask him a question that is so important. I said, are you into pornography? And his face turns red and he said, I burned it yesterday. (gasps) That kind of anger is sin. And it's not, anger is not because you're Irish. It's not because you're Cherokee Indian like me. That kind of anger has a source. It has a root. And it grows on two roots. Root number one, lust. When a man is into pornography, he has sexual excitement that builds up and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And it manifests itself in anger. There's a second root. And that root is guilt. Because again, it's not sexual tension, but it's the tension that we have never accepted responsibility for our actions. And the tension builds up, and that becomes the second root of that kind of anger. This man, his anger came from two roots. Pornography, sexual tension, anger, and a little child he would think of punching him. Think of that. The text that we're going to read, and I want you to look at Acts 24, 16. This is the testimony of the great Apostle Paul. Now, class, look at me. He is setting a goal for his life. But it's not just a common goal. This is a goal that is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And Paul the the Apostle, by inspiration of God, he says, I exercise exercise myself. I expend great effort. I exercise myself to always have a conscience that is void of offense toward God and man. Did you hear that? That's his goal. A life goal. That his conscience would be clear before God and his conscience would be clear before man. Now 
the Lord Jesus Christ gave us an example. That you've read the story, you know the story. Probably the, one of the gr well, uh, let me just ch put it this way: the greatest short story I've ever read is the story of the prodigal son. When he finds himself in the hog pen with no place to go, he said. In my father's house, the servants have it better than this. I will go home. I will say, Father, I'm not worthy to be called thy son. But listen to these words. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. What does he say? I've sinned against God. And I have guilt toward God. And Father, I've sinned against you. By the way, let me just say this right here, unless I forget to say it later. He rehearses what he is going to say. And he plans how he is going to ask for forgiveness. He rehearsed it. He said, I'll go home and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against thee. Make me as one of thy hired servants. When he goes home, he does exactly what he has rehearsed. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, gives us a command that if we are going to give to God before we give to God, and he's not talking just about money. I heard gifted people stand in this choir and sing. I heard gifted, gifted musicians play these instruments. And God says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift. Go first, thy brother. Be reconciled, thy brother. Then come and offer thy gift. We want to read that. But look at what he says. Matthew chapter 5, you have your Bibles. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. If you're physically able and would choose to do it, listen to this. Read with me. I'm going to read out loud. You read silently. You have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause. Look at me. In your mind, circle the word cause. Okay? Now, say, under your breath. Okay, preacher, I've circled cause in my mind. That word is not talking about a reason. It's talking about profit. Now, look at me. I hear people speak of righteous anger. Have you ever heard of it? Oh, I'll tell you, it's just righteous anger. Let me say to you. God said, all your righteousness is as filthy rags in his sight. And brother, if I have righteous anger, it's like a filthy rag in God's sight. Only God can have righteous anger. Only God can be angry without sin. Look, but I, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause, without profit, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Look at the word anger without cause. Attitude. Look at Reka. Listen to that word Reka. What does it mean? It means worthless. And you look at someone and say, you're worthless, no good for nothing, low down, to be a trap. You may not have said it quite like that, but you thought it. See, that sin, that sin 
You're in danger of the council. Being brought up before men and accountable to God. Accountable for, for men. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Look at the very next word. Let's all read that word together out loud. Therefore. What does that do? That reaches back and grabs what has just been said and reaches forward and grabs what's going to be said and it brings them together. It's a connector. It's a conjunction. Look. Therefore, if thy if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled with thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. Amen. Let's talk to God. Father, how grateful we are for the privilege of assembling with this body of saints. Father, we're so grateful that when they came here for this assembly, Father, you came living in their bodies. And God, your glory can fill this building. And God, we ask you today that your Holy Spirit would enable each one of us to open our minds, our wills, our emotions to his promptings, to his teachings, to his enabling. And God, may we do that which will bring glory and honor to your name. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Look at the prodigal son. He realized that guilt is vertical. It's before God. But the more you're tall. Come stand out here. Just bring you, you, you will use your Bible because I'll keep mine. Okay? Bring your Bible. Okay? Hold it up high. Real high. High. Okay? Do you know what that Bible represents? God. But Sam, you don't need your Bible. Okay. Do you know who this represents? My brother that hath ought against me. Okay. When I sin, <laughs> he hath ought against me because I've hurt him. I've done wrong. And because I've done wrong in his sight, he has ought against me. But when I did him wrong, I have guilt before God. God sees everything. God hears everything. God knows everything. We cannot be wrong without God being offended. But let me say to you, it never surprises him. Some wise man said many years ago, has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? He knows everything. Before the worlds were formed, He knew that this mouth, as a teenager, would have, preteen, I'm sorry, as a preteen, would have been a filthy cesspool mouth. He knew it. But He loved me anyway. Amen. 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 But when I hurt Brother Sam. I hurt him. And I have guilt before him. Do you know what I'm going to do because I've hurt Brother Sam? He comes in that door, I'm going out that one. Not because I'm scared of him, because I don't want to face him. I've done wrong! And guilt is controlling my life. Thank you, men. Guilt is vertical. And guilt is horizontal. We hurt people. And my friend, the moment they're hurt. You say, but preacher, I did hurt them. But it was a long time ago. It was day before yesterday. Long time. <laughs> Let me give you a rule of thumb. If you still remember it, they still remember. Remember it. They may have had God's grace, but the Sam said, "Man, God, forgive him. He knows not what he does. 
He may have done that. But I am never going to be free. This man sitting here, by his lust, he has guilt before God. And by the things that have taken place in his life, he has guilt before his wife. What can he do? Oh, my friend, thanks be unto God, there is an answer. The answer God has provided for. Look here. When I have guilt before God, God has made the provision. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? Amen. And he is the propitiation. Let's say that word together. That's a 50 cent word. <laughs> no, it's a five dollar word. Let's say five dollar word. He's the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of all the world. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, He resurrected from the tomb. Mary sees Him. She hears Him call her name, Mary. And she says, Master, and he says, Mary, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. But he does ascend to the Father. And he takes that blood that was sacrificed on the cross and he ascends into the presence of God. And there on the mercy seat in heaven, the blood is applied. And my friend, that blood, it satisfies two things. Number one, when I sin, I have guilt before God. And when I get on my knees and I say, God, I've sinned against you. And God, you said that if I'd confess my sin, that you're faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Friend, when I believe God at that moment and trust him and rely upon him, depend upon him, that moment I confess my sin, he is faithful and he is just and my sins are forgiven, I must receive God's cleansing and the demands, the just demands of the law are satisfied. I am no longer guilty before God. I am justified. Justified. Because Jesus shed his precious blood. The law is satisfied. The law said, the soul that sinned it shall die. But something takes place in my heart. Open please to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Go to the book of Revelation, start backing up to the left. Find Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifice which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Blood of burning goats could never do it. For then would they not have ceased to be offered if the blood of bulls and goats could have cleared my conscience they would still be being offered today because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins class look at me
between me and God, the righteous law of God was satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ. But listen, when I by faith receive that cleansing, my conscience is cleared. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I can stand before God. I can stand before God and have peace because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Hallelujah. Have you sinned? Yes. Have you confessed it? If you've confessed it, He is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. But more. Stay there. But more. What does that Bible represent? God. And we stand before God in peace. Amen. Conscience cleared by the blood of Jesus Christ. But how do, I, how do I get rid of that guilt before Brother Sam? What can I do about it? Friend, you can ignore it. It doesn't go away. You can deny it doesn't change anything. You can excuse it or justify it or explain it. But my friend, God says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Amen. And I've heard him. And I have to go. Say, my brother, I hurt you. I can't change it. What I said to you, what I did to you, it was wrong. Listen, look at Matthew chapter 5 there a minute. Look at those words. When he talks about your brother having ought against you, he says it in the context that I'm angry with my brother without cause. He says it in the context that I would say of my brother, Reka, or that I would say to him, Thou fool! And by saying, Thou fool, I've cursed him. Not cussed him, cursed him. I've put a curse on him. If I've cursed him by saying, Thou fool, how does he get free from it? He needs to say, Preacher, God's got his hand on you and God's going to do something good with your life in spite of your loose mouth. Right? I quote him. Class, we've hurt someone. They have ought against us. God says, you just leave your, your gift there. If you were angry without profit, if you said, you no good. And it, by the way, I'm going to say to you, you may not have verbalized those words, but if you have that attitude,
Jesus said, you've heard that it has been said, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, if you're angry with Alec, with the brother Alec, that is the spiritual equivalent of murder. He said, if you say, wake up, worthless, empty, no account, it's the spiritual equivalent of murder. If you say, the fool, spiritual equivalent of murder. Listen to 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. Listen. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. I did not say that. God did. God said it. God said it. And he says, you bring your gifts. You remember. God the Holy Spirit has brought to your remembrance what took place. He said, just leave your gift there. You go. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer the gift. Who said that? Jesus. Does that apply to my life? Yes. When does it apply to my life? Right now. Anger. Thou fool. Rekha. Hatred. You may not have mashed them in the nose but you mash their heart with your attitude with what you said and we're responsible and the only way that it can be right is for us to go back and say but the Sam don't deserve your forgiveness but Brother Sam, I know I've heard you. Will you please forgive me? This is pretending, okay? And, and I'm pretending. He says, no, I'm not going to forgive you. What do you do then? My friend, you've done what God said to do, and that's what is required. Amen. It's the ball's now in his court. But guilt, the destroyer of relationships, the destroyer of lives, a destroyer. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Bow your heads, please.